So if you have your Bibles, would you get them? And if you have the ability, would you stand to your feet? If you can't, that's cool. Just pray right where you're at. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we can come into your house this day that we can lift our hearts and our hands, lift our voices to you in song and in praise. God, we thank you that you've already healed and encouraged, strengthened and blessed, delivered words of wisdom and words of knowledge to those that are here, God, as we've encountered your presence, Lord. We thank you for what you've already done here in this place today. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go farther with you. We want to go deeper. So we ask that you would bring your word to our hearts, Lord. Make it come alive on the inside of each and every one of us. Today, we don't look to a man or a woman. We don't look to the young or the old. We don't look to the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, God. We look to you. Holy Spirit, you are the true teacher of the church. So welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, today we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we'd ask it for all of the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless them as you would bless us, and at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. God, also today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and so we lift up our brothers and sisters all around the world that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus' name. We ask that you would strengthen them, encourage them, bless them, guide them. God, that you deliver them from the hand of their enemies and from the threats that have been spoken over them. And God, may they endure to the end. May they preach the gospel to all who will hear, God, including their persecutors and their captors. May they repent and turn to you. We praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Amen. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter once again. Hebrews chapter 12. Last time we were together, we breached the subject of being disciplined by the Lord, chastened, if you will. And today, I want to continue on those thoughts, and I have a message that I believe is healthy for each and every one of us. It's called Maturing Believers Through Discipline. God wants to grow us up in life. God wants to mature us. God wants to take us on an amazing life adventure. God has something for each and every one of us in life. And the way that he does that is that God wants to discipline us so that we can be mature followers of Jesus Christ. He was the 12th chapter, starting in verse number 5, says this. He says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Now, there's two warnings that the apostle gives us as he's writing this word to each and every one of us. Holy Spirit's containing it for thousands of years for you and for me. He says, first of all, don't be discouraged. I don't want you to, to, to lose heart when you think about the fact that God is chastening you. Don't forget this exhortation. Don't, don't deny it. Listen up and realize that God is doing something in your life. But also he says, I don't want you to be discouraged. In other words, don't lose heart. Don't faint when God is doing something in your life. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we can say, well, God's against me and, and God's mad at me. And, and, and we just kind of almost throw our hands up. Well, that's it, God. I'm done. I quit. I can't handle this. You know, everything else is against me. And now, God, you're against me and I just can't take it. And yet the exhortation comes, don't forget the exhortation, but also don't faint. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary because God is doing something. Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loves... He chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. In other words, God is showing us his love by disciplining us. You say, but wait a second, I, got, I, I thought that God loved me just as I am. Yes, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. Are you listening? So here God says, whom he loves, he disciplines. God is maturing us through the process of discipline. That means that when you encounter the discipline of God, that you can smile and you can say, Jesus loves me. He loves me enough not to leave me alone. He doesn't want me messed up. He doesn't want me broke down, busted, and disgusted. God wants me to grow up spiritually, and therefore I'm happy that God is doing something in my life. Verse number seven, he says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Now, when it talks about all, it really is talking about all those who are believers, all the people who have been born again into the family of God, that all of those who are now God's children are partakers of discipline. We all share in that same discipline. That means if you are not partaking in discipline, you might need to check yourself 
and check your salvation. Am I really a son or a daughter of God? Because if God is just leaving me alone and, and letting me do my thing, then am I really a child? I, I, I might need to check out my life and see where I'm at with God. goes on and says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. So he starts to give the human example that we had parents that disciplined us. Now, I don't know whether your parents uh, were, were good at that or maybe they went overboard and they abused you growing up. Regardless of that, I have known people who have been abused growing up and yet they still recognized and realized that a human parent has a responsibility to discipline and though they may not repeat the mistakes of the past, they're still going to bring discipline to their children's lives. Why? Because they see the value in it. They see the fact that if I don't discipline my children, they're going to grow up and be crazy and they're going to continue this destructive pattern and this behavior on in life. So it says they discipline us as it seemed best to them. See, we're flawed. We're imperfect. And yet God is perfect. And he says the reason why he's doing this is that we may be partakers of his holiness, that we may share in it, that we may have a part of it. God wants us to take on his very nature. And that cannot happen if we stay immature, ungodly, carnal baby Christians. God wants you to grow up so that you can share in his essence, so that you can share in his very nature. And God is saying to each and every one of us, I want you to grow up. I've got a process and I've got a plan. And the way I'm going to do that is through discipline. Verse number 11 comes along and says this. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now we see the results. We see what God wants to get us to. There is a peaceable fruit of righteousness, even though it's unpleasant when we go through discipline. Even though it's tough going through the trial, God is saying something. He says, if you can endure the pain of the process, then you're going to grow up and you're going to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's where we all want to be. The New York Times had an article about, uh, by, by a lady named Mary Pylon. It was called A Sprint and a Leap into the Unknown. Started out like this. Wesley Williams placed his arms on the shoulders of Lex Gillette, a blind long jumper, to line him up on the runway, then guided him down the track to let him feel the landing pit. Gillette made a couple of small hops into the sand. Can you imagine a blind long jumper? I can't even do it with my eyes open. <laughs> Williams then steered Gillette back to the start of the runway and put him as far to the left in the lane as possible because Gillette usually veers right when he runs. After positioning him, Williams stood down the runway in the middle of the lane at the lip of the sand pit. He raised his arms in the air and with the steady precision of a drummer began to clap. Lie, 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 Williams shouted, using the Chinese word for come, because he finds that it carries better in the din of the stadium noise at competitions. Relying heavily on muscle memory, Gillette sprinted down the track. He knew to jump on his 16th step after more than 108 feet. He listened to William's call as confirmation that he was running straight. And as he approached the sand, William stepped to the side. When Gillette, who's 27 years old, sprints down the runway, he cannot see where he is going. He cannot see the line he is supposed to jump from. And as he soars through the air, he cannot tell when or where he is going to land. Gillette, with the help of Williams, his guide, holds the world record for his classification of the Paralympics at 6.73 meters, or a little more than 22 feet. That's pretty amazing. Now, the article doesn't say this, but Gillette doesn't only do long jump. He also runs track. And recently, he also took up BMX bicycle racing. See, he's not letting his disability impair his life. At age eight, a young, playful boy started to lose his sight. And yet, even though he had cataracts and he lost his sight, he continued to be a boy. And he continued to grow up. And his mama continued to encourage him. And he just loved to run. He loved to play. And he could remember his neighborhood. And he had an image of that in his mind. And so he would jump off of everything, his mom uh, recounted in one interview. He said he would just jump off of everything. And yeah, he had a lot of bumps. He had a lot of bruises. He had a lot of cuts and a lot of scrapes. 
but she continued to encourage him and she continued to help him and she continued to show him how to live life. Eventually he got the cane and he learned to read Braille and he went through school and he got involved in sports programs. And now Williams, his guide, as they run track, they run around the track and they're in constant communication, not saying stuff, but he'll bump them with the elbow. In other words, as they're running around the track, all of a sudden they'll come to the curve and he'll give them a little tap. We're coming to the curve. And so he'll start to turn on his stride and then he'll hit them where we're at the straightaway now. And so he'll start to pick up the pace. No, here we are. We're getting to the end of the, the, the finish line. We're about ready to go to the finish line. Put in the last bit of effort you can. They're constantly bumping into each other and he's constantly communicating with him. Same thing for BMX bicycle racing. You had to have a guide. See, for all of us, the Bible records that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we have a guide. Jesus calls him the Holy Spirit. He is the helper whom Jesus sent to us who is in constant communication with us. And the Bible tells us that part of the Holy Spirit's job description is that he will remind us of everything that he has spoken to us. He's speaking to our lives and he's giving us direction through the word of God. God shows us what this discipline should look like. Take a look at it with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You're there in Hebrews. Turn just a couple pages back through the book of Titus and through the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3. You'll find a very familiar verse for all of us. Most of the time when we approach this verse that we're about ready to read, we're talking only about the word of God and we apply it to the word of God. But I believe that as we read this verse today, we're going to see that not only is it applied to the Word of God, but as the Word of God is applied to our life, that it shows us how God matures us through discipline. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16 says this. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, the word inspiration is a great word. It literally means to be God-breathed. In other words, the very essence of God, his nature, his character, his attributes, that as the word of God is being spoken, it is imparting the power of God himself into that word. Just like when God spoke in the beginning, light be and light was. When God spoke and the planets existed, when God started to speak the water and the waves and the, the birds and the animals and, and the fish of the sea, and God spoke and there they were. In the same way, the Bible says all Scripture, the entirety of the Bible, is God-breathed, that God is speaking and imparting His power in His Word. Look at what it says, and it is profitable. It's good for us. It's helpful. It brings benefits to our lives. It's profitable for what? Look at this. First thing it says, for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is simply a system of teaching. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. Now I believe that as we look at these words for a moment. That we're going to see how it is that God matures believers through discipline. So it's profitable for doctrine. In other words, God cannot expect anything of us if he doesn't tell us what to do and how to do it. So God gives us his word. See, all scripture is profitable for doctrine. All scripture is profitable to show us the will and the way of God. Not only what God expects of us, but how we're going to do it. And therefore, we cannot live life just without the Word of God. You can't live it however you want to live it. Otherwise, you will start making decisions for yourself and you will end up making the wrong decisions. We have to live a life based on the Word of God. In other words, if we never heard that we're supposed to brush our teeth. And so growing up as a child, we never brushed our teeth. How many of you know the moment that you heard, hey, you should probably go to a dentist. Are you experiencing pain in your mouth? Oh, all the time. You should go to a dentist and get that checked out. We'll go to the dentist and they'll say, why haven't you brushed your teeth? Well, no one told me. See, church, what you don't know can actually hurt you. And you cannot afford to be ignorant of the word of God. You have to get into this and find out, how do I live life? What does God expect of me? What is the way to do life? How should I do my marriage? How should I do my finances? How should I raise my children? How can I build a successful business? How am I to do relationships? What am I supposed to do in the community? What is my involvement? What, what, what am I supposed to do? See, we've got to get the answers we need for life from the word of God. Because if we don't, it can hurt us later on in life. We need the wisdom of God. So it's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for systems of understanding. God will teach you his will and his ways. But then it goes on and says it's also profitable for reproof. 
Now, what is reproof? Reproof, uh, a good word for that, we find in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, when it talks about faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen, right? So we know that that same word, reproof, is the same word for evidence. In other words, it brings light. It shows us how it is. So once we understand what it is that God wants of us, how God wants us to do it, then when we start to operate in it, we can go back to the Word of God, and the Word of God will show us our current position. In other words, if, if I'm to walk the way, and God says, this is the way to walk in it, and I start to walk on it, and I start to think, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I look back at the Word, well, yeah, yeah, I'm, it'll show me where I'm at. It'll show me what I'm doing. Now, let's say I start to get off course a little bit. I start to walk off track, and I say, you know what, I like this. This feels comfortable. This feels good. This is wonderful. But then I wonder, am I really doing what God wants me to do? And I look back at the Word. The Word will reprove. It will show me my current state. It'll show me where I'm out of line. The Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, if you're walking in darkness and you don't see where you're going, just like Williams calling to Gillette, lie, 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 lie. What is he doing? As Gillette's running towards him, he may get off track a little bit. Remember, it said he put him as far to the left as he could because he veers right. In other words, as he's running, he may start to get off track, but when he hears the voice of the guide, come on, somebody, are you listening today? When he hears... Come on, somebody in this place today. Did you show up to church or not? When he hears the voice of the guide, all of a sudden he realizes I'm getting off course and I'm going to land outside of the pit and I will be disqualified. So he does a correction of where he's running so that he can run on the straight and narrow line so that he can jump into the safety of the sand pit and land on his feet and win the goal. See, that's what we want for our lives. But we've got to listen to the voice of the guide, which will reprove us. It will show us where we're at. It goes on and it says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. That word correction, I, I love the literal translation of it, if you will. It will set us straight. You ever had the word of God set you straight? Yep. Oh my goodness. There have been times about ready to go do something. All of a sudden the word of the Lord said, don't you dare. I said, yes, sir right? Start to get out of line, start to do your thing, and all of a sudden God said, no, you don't do your thing, you do my thing. You say, okay. See, the Word of God will set you straight. There's things that we think are wisdom, and we realize when we get into the Word of God, they're foolish. We just got set straight by the Word of God. And finally, it says for instruction in righteousness. Now, if we just read that at surface level, that instruction in righteousness, we would go back to doctrine, right? Doesn't that just mean like you're, you're teaching me about how to do life? Instruction in righteousness and, and doctrine, that, that should be the same thing. But how do you know God's not just repeating himself? He uses different words and he speaks on purpose. And so what God is saying is, it's not just a system of understanding that word instruction and righteousness could also be translated, the same word that we find in Hebrews chapter 12, chastening. Or another verse in the Bible that we find is to raise up our children in the training and admonition of the Lord. Or that we are to raise up our children in the chastening of the Lord. In other words, just how we grow up our children, how we raise them up and how we discipline them along the path is the same way that our loving Heavenly Father, who is perfect, He will never abuse us. He will never do it wrong. He always does it right because He's perfect in all His ways. Therefore, God is raising us up to maturity. The Word of God is what does that in our lives. Now, in order to understand this more, I, I saw this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 in the New Living Translation, okay? And I thought it gave a greater understanding for each and every one of us in our present-day terminology. It says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. See, for all of us, we need to understand that the Word of God is the thing that's going to grow us into maturity. The Word of God is the thing that's going to correct us. The Word of God is the thing that's going to set us straight. The Word of God is what's going to give us that course correction so that when we start to get off of line, that we can start to walk by faith in the Word of God that we hear and we can head towards the destination that God has for us. Now, I, I had to include Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number one. I just couldn't stay away from it. You cannot talk about discipline without including this verse in a subject on discipline. Proverbs chapter 12 verse one says this. It says, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Yep. 
You've got to have that verse. You say, Pastor, why you got to have that verse? Here's why. Because many times we're stupid. It's okay to say amen. Okay, because I'm including myself in this with you. Because there have been times where I know what to do. And where I've heard the Holy Spirit's voice. And, and where God has set me straight. And yet I still said, God, I'm going to do me right now. Stupid. In other words, when we make the choice for ourselves, rather than do life based on the word of God, we do life based on our own thoughts, our own desires, our, our, our fleshly will, the want that we have, rather than what God wants. Now, all of a sudden, you're dumb. Lean over your neighbor and say, did pastor just really call me dumb right now? Is he calling me stupid? Look at your other neighbor and say, yeah, he did. Yes, he did. But if we listen, if we love instruction, then we love knowledge. We love what it is that God wants for our lives. And all of a sudden, we will start to grow. We will start to mature. See, discipline is not a dirty word, guys. Oftentimes, we think of it as so bad. Our society's made this out. They, they, they say, you're not supposed to spank your children. No, please, do it in love. Do it. The state of California said a little, little spanking on the buttocks. That, that's completely allowable. Okay. So the word of God comes along and says, get a rod, the, the rod, little, little bit of correction, just a little teeny tiny thing, and I always do it right on my arm first to make sure I'm not doing it in anger, make sure I know what it's going to feel like, and you just get that little thing, and you go across the bare buttocks, and it just gives a little snap. It doesn't make a mark. You're not supposed to leave a mark when you discipline your children. That's what the law says, okay? And so, so you just give a little snap. It leaves a little, little sting, a little shock and awe, Right? And the child realizes I was wrong, you were right, I don't like that, and I'm going to get in line. See, discipline is not a dirty word. Because then your children will start to live lives the way that they should and not be crazy. In other words, if you tell your child, you shouldn't be doing drugs, you shouldn't be sleeping around, you, you should be respecting authority, but you never discipline them when they get out of line, they're just going to do their thing. There's no consequence. See, for all of us, God is saying, I want you to be a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the definition of a disciple. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. That means we are a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. Discipline is not a dirty word. Discipline is good for our lives. And when the Lord disciplines us, we should smile and say, God loves me because I'm his child, and therefore he's bringing discipline into my life. Good for us. The problem is we don't understand how God brings discipline into our life. And so we start to think anytime something's wrong, anytime something's bad, that the Lord is disciplining me. Can I tell you what God does not do with discipline? Okay? Because there are things that we oftentimes have seen in our lives that we say, oh, God must be angry with me. I must have done something wrong, therefore God's disciplining me with us. What I see in the Word of God is I see that there are certain things, like for instance, healing, right? Jesus went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed to the devil. The leper comes to Jesus, he falls down before him, he says, if you are willing, you can just say the word, you can touch me, and you can make me whole. What does Jesus do? Jesus actually breaks the law of that time. He reaches out, he touches the leper, leper, and he says, it is my will, be healed. And he heals him. Therefore, I can know that my physical healing is the will of God. I can see that, that by his stripes I was healed. I can see that in the Old Testament and quoted two times in the New Testament, in the Gospels and in the Epistles. Therefore, that didn't stop at Jesus. That continues on to the church age. So when sickness comes to my life, God is not trying to teach me a lesson by giving me cancer. Are you listening? God is not trying to teach you a lesson by making you sick. That is not the will of God. God's will is that you be healed. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So there are some spiritual things that you should not be saying, God, I guess you're trying to teach me a lesson by being sick. No, you should be rebuking the devil. You should be praying for healing. And you should be doing what you know to do in order to work with that. Now, another thing. What about this? Reaping what we have sown. We, we talked about this a little bit last week. A every circumstance of your life is not... God's discipline. Sometimes we're just dumb and we sow bad seed and then when we reap it, we say, well, God must be trying to teach me something. Yeah, he's teaching you don't sow bad seed. But it's not God's fault. 
Listen, the Bible says if you trouble your own house, you're sowing the wind and you will reap the whirlwind. In other words, if you go messing up your family and you're a jerk to everybody, and then when everybody turns their back on you, well, I guess God's trying to teach me a lesson. No, you dummy. You're just reaping what you've sown. Come on, somebody. You're listening today. We got to understand this. And then the other thing is this, persecution. There are trials that we go through, that we go through them because we're doing the right thing. Bible says everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Jesus said you're blessed when it happens, right? Blessed are you when, when men revile you and speak all sorts of evil against you for righteousness sake. In other words, if it's not for righteousness sake, you don't have to endure it. But if it's for righteousness sake, then you're blessed in enduring it. So we need to understand how does God chasten us? We all need to know that so that when it comes, we can smile and we can say, God's disciplining me. There's a lesson here that I need to learn. God is instructing me from his word, and I need to find out how to grow into maturity. First thing is this is rebuke. God will rebuke us. God will speak to us. He will correct us. The Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, and he will remind us, reprove us, or rebuke us for what we are doing. Just like I talked about, there, there might be something that you're about ready to go and do, and all of a sudden you hear the Holy Spirit say, no, that is not what I want you to do. And you need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you'll be thinking about doing something and all of a sudden a verse comes into your heart. And you go and you read that verse and you realize, hey, this is, this is different than what I was about thinking about right now. And I need to do what this says. Proverbs chapter six, verse 23 says this, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. See, when we don't follow the word, we go into sin, Right? Now, all of a sudden, we have veered off of the will and the way of God, and we are doing our own thing. We're going our own direction, and that is sin. We're going to miss the mark. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So if you don't want to operate in death, or you don't want death to operate in your life, then listen to the word of the Lord. Listen to the rebuke. Listen when God speaks to your life. Listen to the word of the Lord. If you're in church and God starts speaking to something, you start getting uncomfortable, you start sweating. Listen, God is disciplining you. He's getting you in line with his word. Listen and do, and look at what it says. The laws of light, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God wants you to live an abundant, full, blessed, prosperous life, but he can't do that if you're not following his way. How does God do this? How does God discipline us? Next one is this, is affliction. Many times God will bring trouble into our lives in order to get our attention. You say, Pastor, I am not encouraged by this message today. I should have gone down the street to that other church. Well, listen, listen, this, this, this may rub you the wrong way, but if it's rubbing you the wrong way, turn the cat around, all right? Okay, because God is speaking to you today. It was said of Solomon that if he went astray, that God would chasten him with the rods of men. See, sometimes the trouble we face from people around us is intend us to send us back to the word of God. God will bring oftentimes troubling situations or troubling times so that we will seek him once again. God knows how to get a hold of our attention. And there may be times where God is speaking to us, and hey, hey, you're going the wrong way. The word says this, the word says that, and we just keep going. We're, we're, we're dull of hearing. And so God says, okay, that's it. You're going that way? There, go ahead, go down that road. You'll, you'll find some trouble down there, and it'll send you back to me. Let me show it to you in the word of God, Psalm chapter 119. Turn there with me. Psalm 119. The longest psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119, we're going to take a look at two verses. Psalm 119, verse number 67, and then we're going to read verse number 75. Psalm 119, verse number 67 says this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, in other words, after I was afflicted, I keep your word. Do you hear what he just said? He said, God, I learned the lesson. Amen. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. In other words, before there was trouble, I kept doing whatever I wanted to do. But now that I'm afflicted, now that there's trouble in my life, God, I'm following your word. You say, well, maybe that was just circumstances. Maybe that wasn't God. Well, hold on a second, okay, because did God really bring trouble? Do we go through troubling situations, troubling times? Okay, verse number 75. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. 
So in other words, he points to God and he says, God, this affliction is not just circumstances. God, this is from your hand. But you did it in faithfulness. Why? Because God, you don't want me going the wrong direction. And you love me enough to care enough to get my attention and to get me going on the right track. And you used affliction, you used troubling times to get me back into the will and the way of the Lord. Can anybody identify with that and say amen today? So how does God discipline us? How does God chasten us? He does it through rebuke. He does it through affliction. Last one is this, through withheld desires. Through withheld desires. Now, how many parents do we have in the place? Any parents in the place? All right, look at you guys. Okay, some of you guys have this uh, happen at your household. You, you're, you're having dinner, right? And you've got a great dinner planned. It's a healthy dinner. And then afterwards, because you had such a healthy dinner, you're going to have an unhealthy dessert, right? <laughs> We're just going to cheat. It's going to be wonderful. We got a big old cake, right? And you, and you got this ch- cake with, you maybe going to cut up some strawberries and put whipped cream and chocolate sauce and M&Ms and every candy you can find in the house on it, right? We're just going to go all out on dessert because we're going to eat a healthy dinner. And so everybody sits around the table and you pray together and you eat your dinner and afterwards you start cutting the cake and, and you got the cake there set up and all the kids are there drooling over the cake and you're putting on the strawberries and you're putting on the whipped cream and you're putting on the candy and the caramel and the, uh, oh my goodness, everybody is just ready. Your, your fillings and your teeth already hurt. It just looks so good, right? And you look over at one of your kids and they're just drooling and you look from them and you trail up to the dinner table, and wait a second, you didn't eat your dinner. You don't get no cake if you didn't eat your dinner. You go sit down at that table, and you eat every last bite, and when you're done with your dinner, then you can come have the cake, because this is a reward for doing what you need to do. And so what do they do? They fall to pieces. They fall apart. I can't eat it. It's nasty. It's horrible. It's terrible. It tastes like the cardboard box that it came in. I don't like it. I don't want it. You know what? You're such bad parents. How could you do this? And you say, you know what? You're going to sit over there. You're going to watch us all eat it because we all ate our dinner, right? And all the kids are joyous that, that ate and they're, they're singing your praises and they're eating it and they're like, right? And so the other one that didn't eat is over there at the table just for hours. And they're, they're dying over there. And finally, the, the desire for the cake is so great that they take that spoonful of whatever it is that you made and, they, and you would think that they were swallowing cyanide pills or acid or something, right? Oh, oh, ah. Okay, I had a bite. Can I have dessert? No, you got to eat the whole thing. Oh, no, right? And so they painstakingly eat the whole thing and, and they're passing out, they're falling on the ground and finally they, they reach up and they've eaten the last bite and they climb back to the top of the table and, and Daddy, Mommy, I ate my dinner, can I have some cake? And what do you do? You hand them the cake, Right? See, God in his wisdom is no different. Because if God blessed us while we were out of line, we would stay out of line. So God withholds desire. You, but, but wait, 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 wait. The Bible says no good, would think, no good thing will he withhold from those who fear him. Well, listen, if you're not fearing him, he'll withhold. Therefore, we have to understand that God will withhold things from us that we want, that we desire, that are good for our lives in order to get us in line with his word. Once you get in line, once you start fearing the Lord, no good thing will he withhold from those who fear him. Amen. That's good news for all of us. Last verse, last verse for today, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn there with me quickly. Turn there with me quickly. You guys are amening so good, I'm preaching too long. It's all your fault. Deuteronomy chapter number eight, verse number two, look at this. It says, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. See, he's speaking to the children of Israel, and these are the ones who did not die in the wilderness. These are the ones that were raised up. These are the ones that had to wander 40 years because of the sins of their fathers and their mothers who did not believe and did not enter in. The ones who tested God 10 times. God could have wiped that generation out all at once, and he could have taken the children into the promised land, and yet he didn't. He withheld something from them. Why? Look at what it says. It says, to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse number three, so he humbled you and allowed, he allowed it to happen. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. 
that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Where did we start today? We started at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, that all scripture is God breathed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every God breathed word from the scriptures, from the mouth of God. God is teaching us. God is training us. God is maturing us through discipline. And we need to understand that this is not about natural, physical things. It's not about our wants and our desires and our appetites. This is about the word of God governing our life. And so God will withhold good things, our desires, in order to get us in line with his word. Look what it says, verse 4, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Verse 5, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Verse 6, therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Once you fear him, no good thing will he withhold from those who fear him. If you can identify today, maybe you're sitting in here and you realize God is disciplining me, God is chastening me. Maybe you've been hearing the rebuke of the Lord, you've been hearing the word of God come to you through the Holy Spirit. Maybe today you realize that the trouble that you're in uh, wasn't something that maybe you, you sowed and now you're reaping. Maybe the trouble that you're in isn't because of persecution for righteousness sake, but you realize you're out of line and this trouble has come upon you and that God has afflicted you in order to get your attention. Maybe today you realized as, as you were sitting here that there have been some things you've been believing God for, you've been confessing, you've been praying, and yet you're not receiving and you realize, you know what, I might not be walking in the fear of the Lord and I need to take care of that. If you realize that you're in that spot today, then you can smile. You can rejoice because God is your father and because God loves you enough not to just leave you alone to do whatever you want to do and live however you want to live and be out of line, but God loves you enough to grow you up into maturity and he's leading you on the path of discipline. Last verse for today, I promise, I know I said that once before, but every good preacher always has a couple of last verses, okay? Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 1, the prophet Jeremiah starts talking about how he's uh, disciplined. He says, if anybody knows the rod of the Lord, it's me. And he starts talking about God and how God, he actually likens him to a lion or a bear waiting on the road, waiting to maul him and tear him to pieces. That's pretty graphic. And yet he says this in verse number 31 through verse 33. He says, For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Any dads ever said, Son, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me? Right? Never thought you'd say that before, did you? You heard your dad say that and said, You're crazy. This is going to hurt me way more than it's going to hurt you. But then when you became a father, you realized, I don't like doing this. I I don't want to discipline you. I I love you so much, but I love you too much to leave you alone. I I have to get involved. I have to discipline you. See, God does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God is not doing this to break you. God is doing this to build you. Come on, somebody. If you got something for the word of the Lord today, give God a great big praise. God is good. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. Everybody stay put. I want to just take a couple more minutes of your time, then I'll let you go. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes at this time, and I want to talk to you about your life. Some of you in this place, if today was your last day on the earth and you died, you would end up in hell and you would not go to heaven. It's a serious time, so I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. Everybody stay put. We're talking about your eternal life. You've been messing around with God long enough, playing church. You're lukewarm. You're half-hearted. Little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, Jesus says, if you're lukewarm in the book of Revelation, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. That means that half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity is not real Christianity at all. And some of you in this place, if you were to die today, you would end up in hell. You say, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, listen, it's a very real place. Old New Testament talks about it. Jesus himself spoke about it. And just by denying its existence doesn't make it go away. Say, Pastor, well, wait a second. I heard that all roads lead to heaven. No, no, they don't. Not all roads lead to heaven. It's God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. And there's only one way you're going to make it. Jesus said you must be born again. Now, I know our society, Hollywood, movies, television, books, and the internet, they made a mockery out of that term. But it's not about what society says. It's about what the Bible says. You must be born again. What does that mean? It means you've given God all of your heart. And you've given God all of your life. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't do enough good works. You can't do enough good deeds because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. They're going to get thrown out. Can't be too bad to keep you out. Can't clean up your act and come back to God. 
God is saying you have to rely on me and the free gift that I give. You must be born again. And that just means you give it all to me. Give me all of your heart. Give me all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Can't be half-hearted. Can't be lukewarm. You've got to make the decision and cross the line. And today I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you've been raised in church and you've been relying on your parents' faith to get you in heaven. It's not going to work. Maybe you've been relying on your good deeds or your volunteer hours, your giving or your religious experience. Listen, it's not going to make it. Maybe you've been relying on your knowledge of the Bible. The fact that you can quote scriptures, you celebrate Christmas or Easter. Listen, that's not going to get you into heaven. You must be born again. There's no other way to do it. And in a moment, we're going to pray together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. And if you want to be included in that prayer, here's how it's going to work. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And then after that, we'll call you forward and we'll pray together to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. And you say, I might be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. But listen, do you think Jesus was embarrassed of you when he was beaten, bloody, hung on the cross? Listen, he went openly, boldly. And now Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I don't care if you've been in church every day of your life. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. You can do this for the first time today. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you've been lukewarm? You know you've been messing with God. It's time to stop messing with God and get right with him. Get ready to get your hands up. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, the foyer, down in the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. Even online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, you can get your hand up right now. God sees and God's watching them. We'll pray together. If you want to be included in that prayer, get ready to get your hands up. Here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Five, six. Got you over here. On this side. Who else? Six wise people already. Six wise people already. Seven, eight. Got you up there in the family room. Nine. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? There's nine wise people already. Nine wise people already. Up on top, there's ten. Got you over there. God bless you. Eleven, twelve in the family rooms. Got you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Who else today? You want to be included in that prayer? Come on, come on, come on. If this is your time, just get it up high. Thank you, got you right there, 13. Come on, number 14, number 15. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Let's go for God today. If that's you, anybody else real quick, just raise it up high. Just raise it up high right now if that's you. Anybody else? Just want to give you one more moment, one more opportunity, then we're going to pray together. We'll let you go. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, number 14. Thank you, number 15. God bless you. Last call, and then I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to pray together. One last call. Where you at? Got you up there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Hallelujah. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Reverend Elijah is going to lead us in a song. As he sings that, I want you to get a hold of your cold purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle. Meet me up front. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. This is your time. This is your moment. No one leave during this time. Very rude. I'm trying to get people to come up here and you're walking out there. Listen, let's not be rude to the Holy Spirit. Let's allow them to come. We'll let you go in a minute. But let's all stand and let's welcome them. And if you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on down. Let's pray together. Come on. Come on. From the family rooms, bring your children. Come on down. They'll remember this. Jesus, I belong. They're coming. They're coming. Come on. You can come too. reason that I live, for the reason that I breathe. Hallelujah, they're still coming. Come on, you can come too. Just make it way to the front right now. Jesus, I belong to you, for the reason that I live. Come on, come on, this is your time, this is your moment. I believe. They're coming. They're coming. You can come too. Oh, Jesus, I Jesus, I come on, let's keep it going for them. This is your time. You can come right now. Come on. Come on down. 
Come on, make your way to the front right now if you've been wondering if you should. Yeah, yeah, you should. Come on. All right, we're so glad that you guys came. Come on, I'm going to lead you in that prayer. All right, best moment of your life right here, right now. Everybody's going to join in with you. We're going to pray a simple prayer of faith to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? And as you do, listen, you may mess up on a couple words. It's not about the words of your mouth. It's about the prayers of your heart right now. So let's all bow our heads. Let's all close our eyes. Everybody's going to join in together and say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Wash me with your blood. Forgive me my sin. Cleanse me of my past. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life. Just for me. Fill me now with Your Holy Spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Good. All right, now, as we talked about maturing believers through discipline. Discipline is not a dirty word. You are now a disciple of Jesus Christ, and God wants to raise you up and grow you up. We want to help with that process, okay? We won't chase you, we won't, we won't afflict you, all right? But we want to bless you. We want to give you some free information, some free resources as well. Someone in church that can come alongside you, answer any questions you have. It's easy, it's free, okay? My friend, Pastor Joel, right over here is waving at you. He'll get that to you. Okay, a couple quick minutes and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Nothing weird goes on, all right? I'm about as weird as you're going to get today. He's cool, okay? If you guys would make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God.